Good morning. Um, puppy is sleeping. We work late today, so we meaning we go into work later. Um, so we have like a significant half day off, which is fun. I spent um, most of the last hour uh, getting some progress in the Jeanette Winterson book. Where is it? It's called Sexing the Cherry. Love this cover. This is a vintage, yeah, Penguin Random House vintage cover. They have a lot of Jeanette Winterson's books with these kinds of like collaged um, covers. This is such a strange little historical fiction kind of labyrinth of a book. Um, that's the best way that I can put it. I'm about 40 pages in. Um, it's following a giant woman named Dog Woman who has like 30 dogs or something and her son Jordan that she finds floating in the River Thames and she rescues him and they become a family. Very strange, very poetic writing. Um, this is my introduction to Jeanette Winterson. So most of the time I have no idea what's going on in this book, but I still like find the language um, so beautiful and well-written that it doesn't matter if I fully understand what's happening. I know that the son is in search of a dancer that he met in like some kind of party or something. He's like looking for her. So that's where we're at. He's like, has a journey to find this dancing princess or something. So that's what I'm reading. Um, fun. I wanted something that wasn't like nonfiction. Um, so this is like very strange and wonderful. I'm wearing a um, vintage uh, Miro t-shirt. Uh, this little like, heat tech sort of vest thing that I actually took out of another jacket um, from Uniqlo. And then this is a cardigan that's yours, right? Yeah. Was it your... Uh, found on the street. Found it on the street. Okay. Uh, Uniqlo jeans, socks, and these really fun clogs that my friend Mai gave me. What is the brand? A Sportuguesas. I think um, they have dog hair all over them, but they're the perfect uh, transition to cold weather shoe. This is from a friend, it's Zara. The dress? Yes. And this shirt is from uh, Cezanne. Yes. It's this oil stain on my dress. <laughs> and these are like vintage jeans. Levi's? Mm -hmm. Are they Levi's? I don't know. Oh, Lee. Lee. Lee jeans. Just Lee. That's all. I just finished the monthly book club meeting of uh, Katie James's book club that I speak about frequently, that I enjoy so much. Um, and we were discussing uh, The Last Supper by Rachel Cusk. The back cover was eaten by my puppy, um, but it makes sense that he would eat a cusk because he is my son. I think I will leave uh, I wanted to talk to you mostly about this book and then Sexing the Cherry were kind of the two books I wanted to focus on in this video. Um, but I think I'll do this in the morning. My brain is a bit like fried um, and I need to play with my puppy because he's been so good in his crate. 
giving me just a little bit of space to have a moment. So I need to go um, give him some love. Let's cut to tomorrow I'm talking about books. Hi everyone, I'm in my Sunny's book truck hat. Thank you, CJ. Just ran home to let the dog out. I'm on my lunch break from work. And I'm gonna go grab myself a tiny bit of food. The music you hear in the background is supposed to be music for dogs with separation anxiety. Um, it does seem to make him sleepy. And then, yeah, I should be done with work soon and can go back to reading my book, which I want to finish. This is my very strange, weird outfit of the day. Um, that's all. It's rainy, rainy. It is Friday. Friday? Yeah, it's Friday. Got my psychologist in about half an hour, um, but I thought this was a really good moment to update you on reading and also talk about um, the Rachel Cusk that I didn't really get to talk to you about yet, um, that I yeah, wanted to be a big part of this video. So the puppy and Ohadi are taking a little day nap on the couch. Uh, Jacob got his like second vaccine today and like similar to what happens I guess when we get vaccines as humans like you just they get really tired and lethargic so anyways um, so I read The Last Supper by Rachel Cusk for the book club that I mentioned I just absolutely loved this so much um, I thought that I would love it just because I really love Rachel Cusk, um, sorry for the traffic noise. Did read Cusk's essays Coventry and I did not really get on so well with that book. Um, I mean I can always find something interesting in her writing but I didn't, I didn't love that so I wasn't exactly sure like with an essay collection um, what I would think of it but because this is chronicling her and her family, so that means her husband and her two daughters. Um, they go for three months to Italy um, from England. And it reads not like a collection of essays, it really reads like a front to back travel memoir of those three months and all the different places they went and she kind of focuses on different subjects in each part. A lot of like multimedia aspects to this book. Um, a lot of paintings and art references. Um, and it really felt at some points like a Rachel Cusk art history lecture, which for me is like everything I could ask for. Some of my favorite sections um, were Veiled Lady, where she talks about being in the Uffizi Gallery in um, Florence, which is one of my favorite art museums ever. And I had such a incredible kind of profound experience um, inside that museum. And she put all of those things that I felt, like how the light falls in the rooms and like she puts it in such a gorgeous Cuskian way. Um, so that really stood out to me. Also, A Game of Tennis, John Franco's store, which she talks a lot about food and um, eating, which is like a big part of travel, but of course a big part of Italian culture. So that was really interesting. I really enjoyed all of them, like every single one, nonfiction, even if you really, really love the author. I think it's, it's not common. Uh, to like love everything so I did I really really enjoyed this she talks a lot about you know what do we look for when we look for 
when we go abroad or like when we take a vacation, especially if it's something like three months, um, which is a significant amount of time, especially to pull your kids out of school. And it's alluded to that they're going through like a transition in their life and they're kind of lost on what to do. And yeah, those feelings you get when you go abroad, when you really want to be like a different person or like to really be in a different situation. Um, and like to not have the same fights, not be busy with the same problems. And like, of course, you can't escape any of those things when you go into a different culture. That's a big theme in this book, um, what it means to be like a tourist. So much, um, but it really stuck out to me that kind of, I know that feeling of like wanting to reinvent yourself by going into another place. Um, and like the amazing feeling that you can get when you actually feel like you've come out of yourself or like you've changed. Um, and then also the disappointing moments when you feel like I'm still busy with the same shit. I could read you like so much from this book. She loves a metaphor. There's so many, this is like dripping in metaphor. You like travel if you have like a wanderlust personality, um, then definitely check this out. I loved our discussion. Um, we also spoke a bit about how she's also like a privileged white woman who like can afford to take three months in Italy and take her kids out of school. And that's also, you know, not everyone's experience. She's very privileged in that sense. My current read that I mentioned uh, was Sexing the Cherry. I am loving this book so much. I'm a little bit over halfway. I've got like 60 pages left. It's taking place in, let's see, the 1640s um, in England, but also time and space are a big like theme in this book and how they can kind of not exist. Like time is not linear. Um, so, it's, it's also like could be in 1640s, but it could be timeless, but it could be a totally fantastical world where like time doesn't even, is not even a thing. It's the most whimsical thing I've ever read. Um, you know, like someone picks you up and then drops you in the ocean and then you end up like in the top of a tower and like it's kind of a topsy-turvy. Um, narrative about this mother and son. There's one section that I really, um, sorry, I can see like my neighbors in their window and they're doing really silly things and I'm very distracted. One section where the son, Jordan, is in search of this dancer. Um, and he goes on like some travels with someone on a boat and he ends up in this village where there are like 12 dancing princesses and they're kind of like infamous and so he goes to meet them and it's 11 women one of them is missing um and the one that's missing is the one that he's searching for i assume the section of them which is called like the story of the 12 um the story of the 12 dancing princesses it's like each woman is talking about their husbands that they were like set up with and how none of them are around anymore either they murdered them or they ran off with other women or like a myriad of different things um and it's so entertaining how they just don't need men in their lives like also like sex writing um, Jeanette Winterson, you do it so good. Like, this book is super sensation forward. It's very sensory. It's a lot about, like, the body and sex and love is, like, a big theme. Um, love between a mother and son, but also just love as something consuming and also something destructive would say this is quite erotic in my opinion um so that's really fun it's just i'm loving it like it's a hard book for me to describe because it's so many things and it's um it's playing with its form and it's like really not linear and reads kind of like some weird historical fairy tale 
but I don't know. It's really unique, and I'm really in awe of it. So I, yeah, I want to find time to finish it. I should probably run to therapy soon. So that's my update. I'm happy with my reading so far in December. That's all for now. Catch you later. Bye. I forgot to share the most exciting news of my week, which is that I got my ears pierced. Um, I just never did it when I was young, like most people. Um, and yeah, I like enjoyed to wear like vintage clip-on earrings and I just was like, no, I don't need to pierce them. I don't need to pierce them. And then I just decided it's time. So um, I went yesterday, I live like really near a tattoo and piercing place. Um, and I was just like, you know what? I'll just write them and see if they can fit me in. And 20 minutes later I was there and I had my ears pierced. So uh, very excited about all of the fun jewelry that I will be able to buy now because I have always looked at earrings that aren't clip-ons and I was like, if only I had the holes for that. So now I do, uh, but I'll have these for a while until then. Anyway, that's all. Hi, so I was really hoping that I would be able to come on here and say, I finished the Jeanette Winterson book. This is what I, these are my thoughts. But I didn't get a chance to finish the Jeanette Winterson yet because I do have a full-time job, so. Anyway, so that didn't happen now, but I hope soon. Um, I also started listening to the next, um, book club pick for Katie's book club. O Caledonia by um, Elsbeth Barker, I think is her name. It's like a gothic Scottish novel. Um, I just listened to the introduction by Maggie O'Farrell and I'm just gonna fucking love it. I already know, it's very December vibes. I'm gonna go brush my teeth and get ready for bed. Hi, good morning. It's, uh, what day is it? Tuesday? I have some time today, this morning, to finish the book. Um, so, oh, my puppy. He likes to sleep on his back with his paws here. If I can share, like, just personal feelings. Um, Jacob is, like, super anxious, like, really, really anxious dog, um, especially outside um and we took him to the north of the country in the weekend and i mean it was a little nerve-wracking for him to get there in the car but once he was there he really loved it he loved the space he loved that the streets were quiet like two minutes walk there was a dog park that we could just like let him loose and he made a lot of friends and he ran around and he was just so happy and the reality of where we live in the city, it's like, it's so noisy. There's so much construction, there's so many people. So to get him to walk like 50 meters to the right outside of the front door is like a real task and it takes a lot of patience. And this morning I just got really frustrated because I felt like I really want him to enjoy being outside and because he doesn't walk at all, he doesn't expend any energy. So then it's a lot harder in the house because he has so much energy here and it's hard to contain him. I want him to make it to a dog park, but it's really far and I don't know, I'm just, I just get mad at myself when I get really, when I get frustrated with him outside um, that he wants to come out of his leash or he doesn't listen to me. I just need to be more patient and go really slowly, but uh, he's very sweet. <laughs> it's a challenge. Anyways, I am gonna go finish the book now. I've got about 40 pages left and there's like kind of, I don't know if it's a twist necessarily, but there's like a shift. There's a shift in the story and we're 
much more rooted in reality following two characters that I'm not sure if they are two completely different characters or if they are, if the whole first section of the piece was kind of their imagination and now we are in the real the reality of the two people that are like the mother and the son. Um, but I don't know, so I'll go finish it and then I'll come back and talk to you. And so I officially finished. So smart, so poetic. Her language is really delicious, scrumptious, tasty. Something really edible about the way she writes. Um, it's so sensational and also, yeah, there's just so many things I could say about this book. So interesting that she's able to tell a kind of fantastical story, but deal with really real themes. Like towards the end, it becomes clear. It's like uh, climate crisis, uh, pollution towards the end, which starts to jump to like a, a mother that is in like a more real world. She's like a chemist and she is preoccupied with kind of the horrors of um, industrial life and big companies and pollution and mercury in the water and climate crisis. So she's really <laughs> protesting all of those things. Bigger themes that Jeanette Winterson is talking about. We're getting a lot of different perspectives here in the book um, and all of them are denoted, I guess is the right word, with symbols. So whenever you see like a banana, it is like this giant woman living in like the 16, in 1640. Um, and then when you get a pineapple, it's the sun, Jordan. Uh, but then towards the end, when I'm speaking about that, like more realistic, those more realistic parts, you get the symbol, but it's broken. So this is like a pineapple split in half or a banana with the top cut off. A lot about the power of imagination and I wanted to read you one page that put it so well. Um, there's a lot, but I'll just choose this one. Thinking about time is to acknowledge two contradictory certainties, that our outward lives are governed by the seasons and the clock, that our inward lives are governed by something much less regular, an imaginative impulse cutting through the dictates of daily time and leaving us free to ignore the boundaries of here and now and pass like lightning along the coil of pure time, that is, the circle of the universe and whatever it does or does not contain. There are the lives that we live, that we live, and then there are all the lives that we live in our mind and in our fantasy, fantasies, and that is just a big kind of part of this book. It's like, what are the lives that we can live in our imagination? And like, are those less real uh, in ways than the life that we really live? About love and about having a broken heart, about searching for love. So the whole part, first part, right, is about this like giant woman um, who like is, it's, she's really like a giant um, and she can like pick people up by their like heads and like drop, the, like throw them into the ocean and or like, you know, eat their whole body or something. So then you get to one of these broken banana uh, sections and I'll just read this to you. And it's like, so it's from a different perspective of a different woman, but it kind of, um, it explains the giant, the giant, what is the giant? I am a woman going mad. I'm a woman hallucinating. I imagine I am huge and raw, a giant. And when I'm a giant, I go out with my sleeves rolled up and my skirts swirling around me like a whirlpool. I have a sack such as kittens are drowned in and I stop off all over the world, filling them up. Men shoot at me, but I take the bullets out of my cleavage and I chew them up. Then I laugh and laugh and break their guns between my fingers the way you would a wishbone. First stop, the World Bank. I go straight to the boardroom. There's a long hardwood table surrounded by comfortable chairs. 
Men in suits are discussing how to deal with the problems of the third world. They want to build dams, clear the rainforest, finance huge Coca-Cola plants, and exploit the rubber potential. They say, this is a private meeting. I start at the top end and I pick them up one by one by the scruff of their necks. Their legs wriggle in their Gucci suits. I've got nothing against the suits, lovely material. I drop them into my sack, all screaming at once about calling their lawyers and who do I think I am and what about free speech and civil liberties. When they're all in the bag, I leave the room tidy, throw in a few calculators so they won't get bored, and off we go. Next stop, the Pentagon. I wrote literally, slay. <laughs> to be like a giant woman as like a symbol of what you need to become in order to break out from oppression and that like the size is also about rage and the amount of rage. She writes, there are no dimensions for rage. I had an alter ego who was huge and powerful, a woman whose only morality was her own and whose loyalties were fierce and few. It was my patron saint, the one I called on when I felt myself dwindling away through cracks in the floor or slowly, or slowly fading in the streets. Whenever I called on her, I felt my muscles swell and laughter fill up my throat. Of course, it was only a fantasy, at least at the beginning. Really so creative, so layered. I found myself like saying wow um, so much when I was reading it. I think it's such a fun and entertaining book. And also, if you're a Moshfag fan, uh, and specifically you liked La Pabona, um, which I read recently, I feel like you would like this because there's also this historical element and like around the time of the plague and things are really dirty and grimy and disgusting um, and also like hyperbolized in a way that reminds me of like the disgustingness of Lapvona in Moshfeg's uh, universe. So if you like that kind of thing, I think that you would like this. If nothing I said so far, sold this book for you um a fellow bookish content creator here which i maybe won't say his name just in case he doesn't want his name attached to this comment on the internet because it was a private message to me that this was his sexual awakening book so like don't you want to read that like i want everyone to send me the book that led to their sexual awakening and how they could see bodies differently and i want to read all of them Fascinating. Is this my favorite book of the year? Maybe. No, I mean, I have a lot to think about in that respect, um, but it definitely, I think, is a book that I will think about um, for a long time, and I am more than excited to read everything she's ever written. That felt like a really, really long vlog, um, maybe because I've been wanting to finish this video for, like, days, but uh, we finally arrived, so. Thanks for watching. Let me know if there's any books that you want to read before the year is over. I think I'm going to try to squeeze in a few. I have a winter vacation from work starting on the 23rd and I will fly to Rome to be with my parents. And I hope to just like drink a lot of wine and read all day long and sleep. Um, so yeah. Ciao. Love you. Bye.